Hope you had a good weekend. If you're in the US, I'm sure reality was competing with fiction. The Pentagon is talking about aliens. The balloon wars have intensified. And while the Americans figure out what's in their skies, the Chinese are amping up their nuclear arsenal. China wants to triple it. In Pakistan, there's talk of Imran Khan planning to sue General Bajwa, the former army chief. In Turkey, the president is facing flak for poor response and he's going after the builders. And in Japan, the aging society is being offered some outrageous solutions. A Yale professor says old people should commis commit mass suicide. It's got policy watchers worried. We'll tell you all about it and more. First, the headlines. The balloon war intensifies. Now, China accuses the U.S. of sending balloons into its airspace, says it has happened more than 10 times since January 2022. America has denied the claims. Tensions continue to soar in the West Bank. Israeli airstrikes hit Gaza in response to a rocket fired from there on Saturday. Pakistan orders a complete visa ban for Afghan nationals. The decision comes after more than 1,500 visas were issued based on fake residency cards. Prime Minister Modi inaugurates the five-day Aero India show in Bengaluru, the largest in Asia. The star attraction is the Made in India Tejas fighter jet. Hundreds of flights cancelled, thousands of homes without power as Cyclone Gabriel hits New Zealand. Emergency declared in five regions. We start with America's latest obsession, flying objects in the sky and how to shoot them down. The US really is taking it to the next level. Yesterday, they spotted another UFO, unidentified flying object, UFO. And the Pentagon is not ruling out alien visitors. Yes, you heard it right. Yes, I'm sober. No, this is not the plot of a Hollywood film. Yes, aliens have entered the fray. And it's only Monday. Imagine the possibilities. But back to the news. Last week, we told you about the US shooting down a Chinese balloon. Since then, they've shot down three more. And they're not calling them balloons. They're calling them objects. Were these Chinese? American officials have no clue. They say they're working on multiple theories. One of them involves aliens. Let me start from the beginning. Yesterday, American forces downed another object, not a balloon. This one had a fancier description. It was called an unmanned octagonal structure. And it had some strings. It was first detected on Saturday, floating above military sites in Montana. It may ring a bell. This is the same North American state where we saw the Chinese balloon. So on Saturday, America spots an object here. On Sunday, the US Air Force dispatches jets and the object is shot down over Lake Huron. Why was it shot down? Was it a military threat? The US did not deem it a military threat, but they fired a missile nonetheless to bring it down. Why use a missile against something that is not even a threat? The Pentagon had this to say. This object, they said, was floating at 20,000 feet. Commercial flights operate at that height, so it was necessary to bring it down. Later in the day, a U.S. Air Force general briefed the media. He was pressed for details like, what was this object? Where did it come from? Someone asked about aliens too, and the general said he does not rule out aliens. This is for General Van Herc. Uh, because you still haven't been able to tell us what these things are that we are shooting out of the sky, uh, that raises the question, um, have you ruled out aliens or extraterrestrials, and if so, why? And thanks for the question, Helene. I'll, I'll let the intel community and the uh, counterintelligence community figure that out. I haven't ruled out anything uh, at this point. You can't make up this stuff. And this is becoming quite a story. American officials are baffled. The sightings are becoming more frequent. It started with the Chinese balloon. That was on the 4th of February. Since then, there have been three more objects that have been spotted, one near northern Alaska on the 10th of this month. The second one was over Canada's Yukon. This was near the U.S.-Canada border. American jets shot down this one on the 11th of February. And then we have the operation from yesterday. All four objects met the same fate, shot to death. The first one was Chinese. What about the rest? U.S. officials have no answers. They say they're dealing with unidentified aerial phenomena. In simpler words, 
UFOs, unidentified flying objects. It's a term used for anything mysterious that flies at a high altitude. It's also a concept that Americans seem to love. You may have heard of Area 51. It's a secret US military base right in the middle of a desert in Nevada. It's under surveillance 24-7. Planes are not allowed to fly over this area. No one knows what really goes on the, there. Reports say this base is used to develop cutting-edge aircraft, but the popular perception is that this is a base for aliens. In fact, Area 51 is at the heart of all alien conspiracies. The most famous claim is that this area hosts alien spacecraft and bodies. None of this is true as far as we know, but America's culture of secrecy around UFOs fuels conspiracies. A few years back, US intelligence released a report. It shared data about UFO sightings from 2004 to 2021. US officials reported 144 UFO sightings. Then from 2021 to 2022, the numbers almost doubled. 247 sightings were recorded in this period. The same report had some videos too. These are mid-air encounters with what appear to be UFOs. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. U.S. Navy pilots captured these videos. What were these objects? And where did they come from? The U.S. intelligence still doesn't have answers, even with videos. Last year, American lawmakers had a hearing. They demanded answers, but officials did not have any. I would caution, I would simply say that there are a number of, uh, of events in which we do not have an explanation, in which the, and there are a small handful in which there are flight characteristics or signature management um, that we can't explain with the data that we have. The same story is playing out today. It's bizarre. The airspace of two major countries was invaded. But the U.S. and Canada still don't know what's going on. And in typical American fashion, whatever they don't understand, they shoot down. Meanwhile, China has an announcement to make. It spotted American balloons, it says. Beijing claims at least 10 American balloons trespassed over Chinese territory. Safe to say we haven't heard the last of this. And if the world is worried about flying objects and balloons from China, wait till you hear this. China wants to triple its nuclear arsenal. Reports say the plan has been cleared by Xi Jinping himself. How many warheads does Beijing want? At least 900 by 2035. China has a stockpile of around 400 warheads today. They're rapidly expanding it. Let me show you some pictures. Experts say China is building 200 new missile silos. They're also building nuclear submarines and air-delivered nuclear weapons. The plan is ambitious and dangerous. Beijing is said to be working on weapons like this one, a nuke to take out satellites in space. Last year, Chinese military scientists conducted a test. They ran a computer experiment, a simulation of a nuclear blast in space. These scientists have created a model. It evaluated the performance of nuclear anti-satellite weapons. What was the outcome of the experiment? A nuclear blast would create a radioactive cloud in space. This cloud would be as big as the state of New York, and it could destroy satellites that orbit near the Earth. The US has been watching China's build up closely, and this is the American assessment of what's going on. A study published by the US Department of Defense in November last year, it said China could have 1,500 nuclear warheads by 2035. That's more than the previous estimate. China is already firing more missiles than anyone else in the world. In 2021, China's rocket forces launched 135 ballistic missiles. That's more than the rest of the world put together, 135. America says the Chinese buildup is a serious threat. How do you think China responded? Listen to this. They want to stress that the U.S. pointed fingers at China's normal modernization of its nuclear force, made wild speculations, and blatantly tailored a nuclear deterrent strategy for China in this report. China is seriously concerned and firmly opposed to this. We solemnly tell the U.S. that China has the capability and confidence to safeguard its national security interests, and China won't be intimidated by U.S. nuclear blackmail. So why is China suddenly chasing nukes? One of the reasons is deterrence. Beijing feels threatened by the West. Perhaps the Communist Party will feel safer with more nukes. Also, the bigger arsenal helps put more pressure on adversaries. 
This is what experts fear. More nukes will make the PLA, the Chinese military, more confident. It could launch dangerous missions like invading Taiwan. How can China use nukes in a potential battle for Taiwan? Experts call this the nuclear backstop strategy. What is the nuclear backstop strategy? China could point its nukes at two targets. First, the region itself, the areas in and around Taiwan. And second, the U.S. mainland. By threatening to attack these two regions, China could push ahead with an invasion of Taiwan. And this is not a hypothetical situation anymore. Beijing demonstrated its capabilities last year when Nancy Pelosi traveled to Taiwan. That visit was historic. Nancy Pelosi was the highest-ranking U.S. lawmaker to visit Taiwan in 25 years. For China, this tour was a provocation. It retaliated with live-fire drills. Eleven missiles were launched at that time. These were the Dongfeng-15 ballistic missiles. They fell into the waters around Taiwan. Some of the missiles also flew over the island. Why was this significant? And what was China trying to prove here? Two things. Number one, China showed it could attack U.S. naval vessels if they approached the waters around the island. And number two, these missiles were nuclear capable. Reports say the Dongfeng-15 can carry a nuclear warhead. And that's not the only weapon that the Chinese used. In the days that followed, China sent bombers around Taiwan, like this one. It's called the H-6. And this too can carry nukes. This display of nuclear might is a clear provocation for the U.S., and here's another one. China is making a fresh outreach to Iran. Beijing has invited Ibrahim Raisi, the president of Iran. He'll travel to China tomorrow. It'll be a three-day visit. China says President Xi extended a personal invite to the Iranian leader. The agenda, we're told, is elaborate. The two leaders will meet for talks, of course. Also traveling with Raisi are Iranian business leaders, and they will meet their Chinese counterparts. But what explains this outreach, and why now? You see, Iran is in dire straits. International sanctions have crushed the country's economy. There is a series of shortages, shortage of essential supplies. Plus, there are anti-government protests. The regime is on the back foot. China senses an opportunity here. Iran's nuclear deal with the West is, is dead. The negotiations remain stalled. The West is unlikely to go easy with Tehran. Enter China. Not very long ago, China signed a $400 billion investment deal with Iran. Now it is consolidating its hold over Tehran. Tomorrow's visit could set the tone for the future. We'll be tracking it. No such invites for the Pakistani leadership, though, although Pakistan counts itself as China's best friend, iron brothers, they say. They wanted to travel to Turkey, but they were told not to come. And I can tell you they have a lot on their plate at home the Pakistani leaders. Mob lynchings, forced conversions, terror attacks, power cuts. It's never a dull day in this banana republic. And now we have something from the ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan. He has a knack for theatrics. This is his latest. Will he sue General Bajwa? I'll tell you where this began. For the longest time, Imran Khan blamed the United States for plotting his ouster, an international conspiracy to get him out of office. Now he seems to have found a new villain, General Kamar Javed Bajwa, the same General Bajwa who was Pakistan's army chief until November last year. You could say he was the supreme leader of Pakistan and Imran Khan was removed from office on his watch. And now Imran Khan wants an investigation. He's calling for an internal military inquiry against General Bajwa, who, by the way, was also the man who brought Imran Khan to power in the first place. I know it sounds confusing, but you may remember Prime Minister Khan was said to have been selected and not elected to office. It is said that Imran Khan enjoyed the support of the Pakistani army when he was brought to power. But then he played his cards wrong, rubbed the generals the wrong way, and found himself out of power. And now Imran Khan says the Pakistani army should conduct an inquiry against General Bajwa. It's safe to assume that the army won't pay heed. So here's a question being asked in Pakistan. Will Imran Khan sue General Bajwa? Will he take him to court? The law says he can under Article 6 of Pakistan's constitution. But common sense says he can't and he won't. Because which Pakistani politician has survived the wrath of the army? Also, Imran Khan has been out of office for a while. So why does he want a probe now? What is the trigger? General Bajwa has spoken about his ouster. That seems to be the trigger. He wrote a column recently. He said that his quote-unquote crime was that he did not step in to save Imran Khan's government. 
Bajwa, of course, was being sarcastic. He was also quoted as saying that these people were dangerous for the country. Which people? Imran Khan and his party, the Tehreek e Insaf. So Imran Khan has now taken offense and gotten ideas. Let me quote from what he said. There should be an internal army inquiry against him for the statements that he proudly and arrogantly gave that I made the decision because the country's conditions were such as if he was some economic expert. The he here, of course, is General Bajwa. And it did not end there. Imran Khan then said that General Bajwa favored some of the biggest crooks in the country. One of them, perhaps, was the prime minister, who then stopped being the prime minister. Imran Khan also testified to a fact that the world already knows, and I'm quoting again, the military in Pakistan means one man, the army chief. So the whole policy of military vis-a-vis -vis their dealing with the civilian government depends on the personality of one man. Funny how every Pakistani leader realizes this only after being put out of office. But this is a dangerous game because Imran Khan is taking on not just General Bajwa, he's firing at the Pakistani army. In a leaked audio, Imran Khan has been heard saying that the army and the ISI wanted to quote-unquote murder Pakistan's most popular leader. He's, of course, referring to himself as the most popular leader. And for a change, he's not the only politician openly speaking against the army. Listen to what Nawaz Sharif said last month. He blamed General Bajwa and former ISI chief Faiz Hamid for Pakistan's present situation. Nawaz Sharif blames the two generals for it. And he said that they played a role in rigging the 2018 general election, the same election that brought Imran Khan to power. So what's happening in Pakistan is very interesting. The army is facing the heat. Imran Khan, whatever his reputation may be, remains an influential leader and he leads arguably the biggest political party in Pakistan. Nawaz Sharif leads the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, PMLN, one of the three main political parties of the country. Rawal Pindi won't be impressed with the kind of rhetoric coming from these two parties. So are the best days for the Pakistani army behind it? Maybe not, but it's surely facing a lot of flack these days. Speaking of which, we have news of the BBC. The broadcaster is in trouble, but you already know that. The chairperson, Richard Sharp, is caught in a scandal. In the year 2020, he helped former Prime Minister Boris Johnson get a loan. Just after that, Johnson recommended him for the BBC chairperson's post. Was this quid pro quo for the BBC job? Was getting Johnson the loan a prerequisite for this appointment? It's been called a pals appointing pals donating to pals situation. Sharp, of course, denies the charges. But a parliamentary committee has accused him of making significant errors of judgment. Here's a report on the scandal. BBC chairperson Richard Sharp is in hot water. His undisclosed dealings with former Prime Minister Boris Johnson are out in the open. He helped the former PM get a loan worth almost $1 million and didn't disclose this information when he was being interviewed for his job at the BBC. Now, the House of Commons Digital, Culture, Media and Sport Committee has come out with a report. It has said Sharp made significant errors of judgment and that it has put the BBC's reputation at risk. Now, Sharp's ties with the UK's Conservative Party weren't a secret. The former Goldman Sachs partner was a major donor, having reportedly given the Tories about £400,000 or close to half a million dollars. During his investment banking days, Sharp even worked with current Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. He also acted as an advisor to Sunak during the pandemic, when Sunak was Johnson's Chancellor of the Exchequer. So when all this was in the public domain, why is Sharp under the spotlight now? It's because of the loan that could be considered a conflict of interest. You see, the BBC is the UK's public broadcaster. It's nominally independent, but being a public entity, its chairperson is recommended by the government of the day. To maintain a veneer of impartiality, the candidates are scrutinized by a cross-party panel. This is the House of Commons Digital, Culture, Media and Sport Committee. When applying for the post, the potential chairperson has to make any conflict of interest public. But Sharp did not do that. Let's look at the timeline of events. Johnson was in a spot of bother financially in 2020. A friend of Sharp's, multimillionaire Canadian businessman Sam Blythe, wanted to help the PM out. He got in touch with Sharp, who arranged a meeting between the businessman and the cabinet office. 
This led to Blythe providing an £800,000 loan guarantee to Johnson. That's almost a million dollar guarantee. Then, in January, Sharp was named the government's preferred candidate for the BBC chair role. During the pre-appointment hearing, Sharp did not mention his role in facilitating the loan for Johnson. On February 16, 2021, Sharp formally took up the role of BBC chairman. The appointment is for four years. The loan saga was forgotten for the last two years. Then, the details were made public by the media on January 21, 2023. Over the last few weeks, it's been bedlam. BBC staffers are livid. Opposition MPs have been calling for Sharp's resignation. The parliamentary report says his omissions constitute a breach of the standards expected of individuals applying for prominent public appointments. The BBC's reputation has taken a hit. The scandal throws it open to accusation that it's been compromised. Ironically, it's mostly the Tories who've been criticising the BBC's impartiality. Now, their own links to Sharp have further damaged the BBC. Labour MP and Shadow Culture Secretary Lucy Powell has called the committee's report damning. She says Sharp's position is increasingly untenable. So will the chair step down? Well, Sharp seems to be dragging his feet. He's been apologising for his actions, but there have been no resignation hints yet. He seems to be waiting for an independent inquiry to conclude. There's also a separate internal investigation by the BBC examining conflicts of interest. But is this all an eyewash? The chair selection is a political appointment. The BBC itself has said it plays no role in the recruitment of the chair. So when the chair is chosen by the powers that be, how can it ever be completely impartial? There will always be accusations of favours being traded. After this fiasco, the BBC chairs risk being seen as government agents, or worse. For a broadcaster that prides itself in lecturing governments and making investigative documentaries, the scandal could not have come at a worse time. Vantage continues after a short break. And former Bihar Chief Minister Lalu Prasad Yadav returned to the national capital on Saturday after undergoing a successful kidney transplant surgery in Sydney, in Singapore. This was in December over the past year. The RJD president was unwell. He was under treatment. Earlier, his daughter, who had donated the kidney to her father, actually shared an emotional post on Twitter about his recovery journey. And now to other stories. We're taking you to Vishakhapatnam, where at least nine people were injured in a mishap. This is at the Vizag steel plant in Andhra Pradesh. Now, the explosion occurred in a conveyor belt, which was carrying liquid steel in the plant. Four plant employees and five contract workers were among those who were injured. Meanwhile, the trade union leaders demanded an investigation into the entire incident. And now in Uttar Pradesh, where a fire broke out in Kanpur, in a part of Kanpur in Uttar Pradesh. The fire destroyed eight vehicles parked in police custody. Local police reached the spot. They brought the fire under control with the help of the fire department. But the cause of the fire is as of yet unknown. Barra Thana ke antaragat padhne wali ek purani chauki, Barra Chauki, jo vartaman mein jahan par sarkari kare nahi hota hai, par aag lagne ki suchna mili. सूचना मिलते ही स्थानीय पुलिस मौके पर पहुंची और फायर सर्विसेज की मदद से आग पर काबू पा लिया गया किसी तरह की जनहानि वहां नहीं हुई है और आग किस वजह से लगी इसकी जांच की जा रही है All right, and a hand grenade was found lying near a canal in Ganga Nahari, which is a rural area of Uttar Pradesh's Merut. Now, the grenade was disposed of by a local team of people along with a bomb squad. A preliminary inquiry has been ordered after seizing the hand grenade. And now to Tamil Nadu, where the Governor R. N. Ravi participated in a graduation ceremony at a private college in Coimbatore yesterday. Ravi addressed the students after awarding them degrees at the ceremony. He said India is the fastest growing economy in the world. You'll remember that his tenure has also faced quite a bit of controversy in conflicts with the DMK. And now to a story that could change the fortunes of Kashmir. It has vast deposits of lithium. What's lithium? The oil of the future.
Lithium is a chemical element, a soft, silvery, white metal, the key ingredient for electronic goods in a world heavily reliant on electronics. And moving towards electric vehicles, lithium is the future. And Kashmir has a jackpot. The discovery was made by the Geological Survey of India. The announcement came from the government of India. They found lithium reserves in the Riyasi district of Jammu and Kashmir. How much lithium are we talking about? About 5.9 million tons. For perspective, this is more than 5% of the world's total lithium resources. Which country has the largest deposits? Chile, followed by these. India now stands at the seventh position, the seventh largest deposits in the world. And India is just getting started. The first discovery of the metal was made in 2021. It was found in the South Indian state of Karnataka. Those deposits were much smaller, nowhere close to meeting India's larger EV plan. But the latest discovery, the one in Jammu and Kashmir, has put India on the world's lithium map. India has literally hit the jackpot. The country is making a major push towards adopting electric vehicles. And the target is ambitious. By 2030, India plans to make 30% of its cars electric. What's the share today? 0.5%. That's the share of EVs on Indian roads today. So India has a long way to go from 0.5 to 30. And the discovery in Jammu and Kashmir is critical to this plan. You see, lithium is a key ingredient of batteries. It will drive the EV market. Electric cars run on lithium ion batteries. And these batteries, as the name suggests, cannot be made without lithium. It's an extremely light metal. So using lithium makes batteries really light, which improves performance. It optimizes the storage of energy. The lithium-ion battery technology is said to be the best right now, which is why every country is trying to set up solid lithium supply chains. And every country is looking to find reserves in their own territory. For India, the discovery will be a game changer, and I'll tell you why. Why is this a game changer? Today, we import most of our oil, and we pay a lot of money for that oil. Last year, India spent $119 billion to buy oil. It's a burden which neither the government nor the people are happy about. Now we're working towards a 30% EV fleet by 2030. That should reduce the oil bill. But to build EVs, you need lithium. And if you don't have reserves at home, you'll have to import that lithium. So while the oil bill may come down, the lithium bill will go up. Sample this. In the year 2020, India imported lithium batteries worth 8,800 crore rupees and lithium metal worth almost 200 crore rupees. The discovery in Kashmir would change that. India can dip into its own reserves. It will not have to import. Let me ask you a question. How much of India's rare earth metal demand is fulfilled by imports right now? How much do we import? Almost 100%. All of it comes from outside, and that's not a pretty place to be in. Next question. What else is lithium used for? Everything that runs on a battery, smartphones, laptops, toys, wireless headphones, entire energy storage systems. All of it needs lithium. Again, where is most of the world's lithium? In an area called the Lithium Triangle. This triangle has three countries, Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Add Peru to the mix, and 67% of the world's lithium resources will be accounted for. Australia, too, has large resources, about 7.9 million tons of lithium. So far, India has had to depend on these countries and China. Why China? Because China controls 65% of the world's lithium refining. And depending on Beijing for a strategic resource like this would have been less than ideal. So India started looking for alternatives at home. In the last few years, lithium exploration has been taken up quite aggressively. The Geological Survey of India has carried out 19 projects in the last five years. Their goal is quite clear, to find lithium. And where are they looking? Across the country. Green transition is a policy priority for the government. Though the impact of these efforts may not be obvious for a long time, the deposits found in Kashmir, they may take five to seven years to be made available commercially. But given the strategic value of lithium, it's a very significant start for India.
Meanwhile, the headlines from Turkey and Syria aren't getting better. The death toll has crossed 33,000. A week after the quake struck, the toll continues to rise. Rescuers are still on the ground trying to find survivors beneath the rubble. But after all these days, hope is dimming and the anguish is turning into anger. Anger at the shoddy construction work that led to so many buildings collapsing. Anger at the looters running riot. Anger at the Turkish government's slow response. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan will be facing an election this year. This may be the toughest in his over two decades in power. The earthquakes have exposed the systemic problems behind the construction boom he championed. Tonight, we'll bring you the full story, starting with the miracles. Turkey has sub-zero temperatures as we speak. Entire cities have turned into rubble. Yet all these days later, people are still being found alive under the debris. Like this little girl. <laughs> A woman and child were rescued in the city of Hate on Sunday. They were found by rescue specialists from El Salvador. <laughs> A man was pulled out of the rubble near the epicenter of the first quake. This was after almost six days of being buried. Look at him, pumping his fist in the air as he's lifted in a stretcher. Hi, mashallah, as heartwarming as these stories are, they're few and far between. For most others, it's already too late. The attention has turned to why so many were trapped in the first place. It's no secret that Turkey is at high risk from earthquakes. The last big one was in 1999. More than 17,000 people died in that quake. The government took some decisions to avoid a repeat. It brought in new building laws, new rules to ensure that buildings don't crumple in the event of a quake. But that hasn't helped. Look at all the buildings that came crashing down. Evidently, the rules were followed only on paper. And the government did not help by offering amnesties. It let shoddy buildings stand for a fee. This worked for everyone. The government made millions in fines, and the builders got away with poor construction. Officials say there were 75,000 such buildings in the affected areas. 75,000 buildings were given amnesties. Do you know how many such buildings exist in Turkey? 13 million. This is according to the Turkish Environment and Urbanization Ministry. A report says half of all buildings in this country are in violation of regulations. The government is now going after the builders. It announced 113 arrest warrants on Sunday. It's all over the news. Videos of builders being arrested have flooded the media in Turkey. And while the builders are at fault, could they have done it without the support of the system? Are these arrests then just an attempt to deflect blame? The government is also targeting looters. Reports say there are squads roaming the affected cities. Many carry weapons and rob stores and houses left open due to the quakes. Our shops are here. Mine was looted because the back entrance collapsed. They stole the cash money and took 70,000 liras directly from the register. They took a few of the goods we sell, but they couldn't take much because the shelves were inside. They took the cash money instead. President Erdogan has promised exemplary punishment for looters. The military is now patrolling the streets, but critics say he took too long in calling them, that he did not want to be too reliant on them. But he had to call them when it became quite clear that the government and the NGOs alone could not manage on their own. This delay may have resulted in even more lives lost. It has left the people of Turkey angry. In neighboring Syria, it's worse. Northern Syria is controlled by rebels, not the government. They're not getting the aid they need. They say the international community has let them down. 
Remember, they've already suffered more than a decade of civil war. The earthquakes are proving to be the proverbial last straw. The Syrian government wants all aid to go through official channels. But there are fears that the regime won't send it to the rebels, to the rebel-held areas. In the past, it has gone to rebels with a surrender or starve approach. So why can't the aid be sent directly to the rebels? Because of sanctions and UN politics, sanctions stop anyone from dealing with the rebel groups, many of which are considered terrorists. And Syria's allies in the UN, Russia and China, play a role. In the past, Russia and China have vetoed aid being sent to the rebels. But now, because of the new crisis, some of those restrictions are being lifted. They're loosening. But what Syrians are getting doesn't even begin to cover what they need. Semiconductors are back in the news, this time not because of a shortage, but due to a glut. There is a surplus of chips in the global market, which is bad news for chip makers. Revenues are shrinking and jobs are being cut. But why is the surplus of chips bad news? Here's a quick primer. Semiconductors had become the buzzword two years back. That's when the pandemic struck. What are semiconductors? Think of them as the brain of mobile phones, laptops, vehicles, even weapons. They're the building blocks of these devices. The world had run out of them, and they were all over the headlines. There were reports of large-scale chip shortages. It was a time when people were working from home and supply chains were disrupted. Demand for electronic products went up sharply by more than 10%, according to some estimates, which meant that there was a higher demand for chips. In fact, I have some figures with me. Global semiconductor sales increased more than 26% in 2021. They crossed $550 billion. The year before this figure was $440 billion. How did the industry counter this high demand? They shipped more than a trillion semiconductor units in 2021. China was the single largest market with sales worth nearly $193 billion. Companies increased output, but they struggled to match the high demand. At the same time, they also made billions of dollars. Fast forward to the second half of last year, 2022. Here's where the trend reverses. Demand fell sharply as offices opened up, smartphone shipments fell by 11%, personal computers by 15%, and the result was this, a fall in chip sales. Year on year, chip sales fell by 15% in the fourth quarter of last year. And in China's case, the fall was the steepest. As of November, sales plunged by more than 21% in China. Customers did not buy as many products as they did earlier. Where do you think that left chip makers? With huge stocks of unused inventory. How much exactly? Estimates suggest three to four months worth of supply. Almost all of it gathering dust. Now companies are cutting their losses and jobs. Intel let go of 200 people and they cut salaries by up to 25%. What about China, a country already fighting a chip war with the United States? Its problems have multiplied. On the one hand, there's America. It accounts for about half of the world's semiconductor market. The U.S. is stitching a coalition with other major players, the likes of South Korea and the Netherlands. They're joining hands to counter Beijing. What will they do? Block China's access to advanced equipment for chip production. Take High Silicon, for instance. It's the design arm of Huawei. In 2022, the company fell out of the list of the world's top 25 semiconductor vendors. Its revenue declined by 81% compared to 2021. And now Beijing is dealing with a drop in demand. China's top chip makers saw losses of more than 26%. I'm talking about the Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corp, or SIMC. Its profits fell by 26% to $425 million, and the company anticipates that this trend will continue, at least for the first six months of this year. Experts say the slowdown is a global phenomenon. It stems from the lack of demand, and they're right. But remember, China is aiming to be self-sufficient in this game. It wants to cut dependency on the U.S. and other nations for importing raw materials. Things aren't going as planned, though. Plus, there's the India factor. You see, all eyes were on New Delhi as the U.S.-China tussle played out. India was seen as the alternative to help fill the gap in the chip industry. Reports say the Biden administration is now seeking New Delhi's help in shifting supply chains away from China. The meeting between the two sides last week also sought to boost investments in India. How big is India's market? The semiconductor market here is projected to see revenues exceed $300 billion by 2026. New Delhi, on its part, has encouraged companies to manufacture chips in India. It announced a $10 billion incentive in 2021 to bolster its case. So far, four global companies have responded to India's offer. At the center of this invite, roll out a second round of proposals soon. 
but there's a rider. The situation is different now from a supply deficit mode there the chip market is in a demand deficit state. How India adapts to this remains to be seen. Japan is facing a population crisis. Their premier issued a dire warning recently. He said the country is on the brink of not being able to maintain social function. And while Japan is looking for solutions, one suggestion has triggered a storm. Mass suicide for the old. This is courtesy a professor at Yale. He said old people in Japan should just kill themselves. His remark has drawn a lot of backlash. But guess what? It has also won him an audience. Apparently, this was done in Japan in the past. But can it even be considered in a modern society? The professor has an explanation for what he said, and critics fear he may end up influencing policy decisions. Here's a report. Japan has a new wrinkle. Along with its fertility crisis, it faces an aging crisis too. A Yale professor has presented an unorthodox solution. He suggests mass suicide or seppuku of the elderly. Seppuku refers to a ritual disembowelment. It can be both obligatory or forced. Samurai did it to themselves until the 19th century in Japan. The population is experiencing sort of rapid aging. Then unless we do something, then, then, then the country and the economy. The solution sounds a bit harsh. As you can imagine, his remark has sparked outrage. Yusuke Narita is an assistant professor of economics at Yale. He made these remarks on a streaming news program in 2021. At the time, he said, it's the only solution and it's pretty clear. This year, he was asked to defend his views in class. To do so, he showed a clip from the 2019 horror film, Midsommar. In the movie, a cult forces an older member to jump off a cliff. Narita said it's difficult to say if this is a good thing, but if you think it's good, then work hard to create a society like that. But why are we talking about this now? It's because this week, the professor said he was taken out of context. He says he was discussing a growing effort to make room for the youth. Though he still says euthanasia could become mandatory in the future. He says this would allow younger generations to come forward, whether in business, politics or arts as the older generation refuses to leave. And this surely does not help Japan, especially due to its fertility and aging crisis. It has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. Last year, it saw its population plunge by more than 600,000. It also has one of the highest life expectancies in the world. Last year's data makes the Japanese population the oldest in the world. Those over the age of 65 accounted for about 30% of the total. In 2020, nearly 1 in 1,500 people in Japan were aged 100 or older. Remember, Japan also has the most public debt in the first world. It has a shrinking workforce. Enough young people are not filling the gaps in its stagnating economy. But Japan is not the only country that's facing aging. The world is aging at a rapid rate. This is pushing us into a new era in human history. By 2030, 34 nations will have over 20% of their populations aged over 65. This will include Germany, Italy, Canada, France and the US. This could also explain why Narita's comments have not just invited backlash, but also won him an audience. He's viral on social media. He even spreads his message through comedy shows and energy drink ads. And he's not alone in sharing such opinions. In 2013, the country's finance minister said something similar. He suggested that old people should hurry up and die. Surveys note that the Japanese public supports voluntary euthanasia. We're told many fear he's rekindling views that have gained traction in Japan. Deference towards older generations is waning. The young are frustrated. They say they're being held back. So the Yale professor's remark may spark more than the social media debate. It could unduly sway public policy. Narita says his prime concern is how a few tycoons continue to dominate industries and that he only meant that the older generation must be phased out. He has softened his language since. He regrets not being more careful with his words. Regardless, he continues to say that the discussion is coming. He doesn't advocate its introduction, but predicts it will be more broadly discussed.
And now it's time to wrap up with Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Israel saw protests, both inside and outside the lawmakers' chambers, against the Netanyahu government's judiciary plan. Israeli lawmakers engaged in a shouting match in a parliamentary committee meeting, deciding on the plans to overhaul the judiciary. Meanwhile, thousands flocked to Jerusalem to protest against the move. Spain is known for its beautiful almond blossoms, but this year, its almond trees are blooming a month early, thanks to climate change. Rio de Janeiro held a spiritual cleanse. This came ahead of its iconic carnival. We're leaving you with these images. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>
Hello and welcome to the late night edition with me Ayush Man Singh John Wall breaking news coming in Pakistan objects to India constructing border outposts at Sir Creek names construction on its territory the home ministry sanctioned 50 crore rupees for the construction of eight multi story bunkers in Sir Creek officials say the decision was taken in view of the constant infiltration of Pakistani fishermen and fishing boats in the area India has replied to Pakistan saying construction is taking place in Indian territory reports suggest objections from pakistan come as permanent concrete structures would give the bsf the strategic advantage that's the piece of breaking news that's coming in i'm joined by my colleague arunima who's getting us this piece of breaking news so arunima what more are you getting uh, from your sources could we see some escalation taking place at sir creek so these are you know total of eight bops out of which three uh, lakpatwari dufa bed and uh, samudra bed which is called morya bed by the pakistani side these three are right on uh, the international boundary so samudra bed is on an island like structure uh, pakistan has always argued that the sir creek boundary actually flows through the eastern bank of uh, the waterway there uh, government of india has argued that the boundary is actually through the midstream so that has been a bone of contention and now that india has started constructing these three bops they are multi storied on the top layer we are told there will be surveillance equipment and we are also told that on the pakistani side they have already screwed up their uh, you know border surveillance mechanism uh, there there are uh, infrastructural developments on their side and because there was concern that in the harami nala area uh, it was constantly being used uh, for infiltration there there has been narcotics seized by bsf so there was a lot of concern about narco terrorism and terrorism in this area the reason why mh accepted the bsf suggestion to construct these uh, bops but now pakistan is raking up this issue uh, and uh, india is quite confident that whatever they might argue uh, india is on on right side of international maritime law pakistan though is creating ruckus in this matter just like china uh, on, along the line of actual control contests the claim line Pakistan it looks like is trying to follow the same strategy to derail India's border infrastructure in this run of Kutch area right and these eight outposts arunima are these likely to give india some sort of strategic edge which is why we're seeing this counter coming from pakistan absolutely out of these eight five are in the marshy lands of harami nala three like i said are on uh, the the waterway the, it, it's an estuary there uh, so it, it's uh, it gives you direct sight over uh, the international boundary real it takes you closer to the international maritime boundary so therefore if there is any attempt uh, to violate our territorial space to smuggle in narcotics or to smuggle in uh, any kind of uh, any kind of uh, in, you know person who is inimical to india's interest it would immediately give psf personnel a uh, clear vision the way these have been planned uh, at least the 15 bsf personnel can stay in these three uh, bops which are right on on uh, the international boundary Uh, and it has also surveillance equipment so it will be a huge strategic advantage for bsf something obviously that pakistan doesn't want and therefore at a commander level meeting uh, at the flag meeting between pakistani rangers and bsf they have raised this issue um, and taken this up bsf however is contesting it cpwd which is constructing the BO, uh, bop is going ahead with his work we are told that the bro which is responsible for constructing the roads which lead to the bop they are also going about with their work there right thank you arunima for getting us that piece of breaking news shifting focus to another battle between governors and state governments this fight has now reached punjab ladies and gentlemen chief minister bhagwant man has hit out at governor banwari lal purohit saying his government is accountable to the people of punjab and not to any center appointed governor this comes after punjab governor banwari lal purohit wrote to the chief minister claiming a lack of transparency in selecting teachers to be sent to singapore for training as well as details on the appointment of the punjab information and communication technology corporation chairman the governor has asked the chief minister to reply to his letter in a fortnight otherwise he will be compelled to take legal advice so that war now uh, coming in the state of punjab i'm joined by my colleague pallavi ghosh who's getting us this piece of breaking news so pallavi strong words coming in from the chief minister of punjab we see the delhi government versus the lieutenant governor now the same face off taking place in aproled punjab 
Yes, but the interesting thing also is that in Delhi we see LG versus the Delhi government, but Delhi is not a complete state. It remains a union territory. But Punjab is a full state, so there I think the war is going to be even more aggressive because the Punjab government is not going to back down, saying that we have complete powers. And like in Delhi, if you remember, a delegation was being sent to Finland, and that became a tug of war between the Delhi government and the LG's office. Over here too, there seems to be a tug of war over a delegation which is being planned by the Punjab government to Singapore, and that. Question is being asked by the governor that please give me the details, and if you don't, then we can take strong legal action. Clearly, Bhagwan Man is no mood to back down, and which is why he's standing up to the governor, saying that I'm not going to listen to anyone who has been appointed by the centre. Rather, the people are the ones who voted us to power. This doesn't augur very well because at the end of the day, the governor and the state government are at loggerheads. It has its impact also on the working of the government. We saw this happening in West Bengal also. If you remember, I was born between Jagdeep Dhankar and uh, Mohammad Abanaji. Right, and Palu, please stay with us. The fireworks are not just in Punjab. More breaking news coming in. On the last day of parliament before recess, the Congress party aims to up the ante against the centre, raising objections over the expunging of remarks of Jairam Ramesh, Pramod Tiwari and Congress Chief Malikarjun Kharge. This comes amid the Adani storm in parliament where Rahul Gandhi's remarks were also expunged. The Congress is planning protests and is likely to approach the President of India. Pallavi continues to be with us on the broadcast. So Pallavi, what's the latest from the Congress camp? So today, if you heard what Mr. Balikarjun Kharge was objecting to, saying that the chair is acting at the behest of the government, that comment, of course, has been expunged from the records of the parliament, and not just his. Two more Congress leaders, their comments like their number of age, that of Romo Tiwari, too, have been expunged from the records. And this has really angered the Congress, saying that why is it that only Congress leaders are being targeted, and why is this a selective outrage being shown by the Speaker or by a chairperson? So what they plan to do is to make this a big issue, infringement on the freedom of expression and rights of a member of Parliament. They want to protest also, and this is what they're planning to take to the President of India, saying that the expunged comment should be revoked. And second, this is unprecedented about how the opposition is being targeted during the working of the parliament. Right. Thank you, Pallavi, for getting us that piece of breaking news. So the face-off over the Adani storm now with this, with these expunging of these remarks in parliament uh, set to escalate uh, with the Congress training its guns at the centre. Let's shift focus to some more breaking news coming in, ladies and gentlemen. Nine people, including the principal, students and the youth festival organiser of Jain University's Centre for Management Studies in Bengaluru, have been arrested over a skit that allegedly defamed Dr. B.R. Ambedkar and Dalits. The Karnataka State Commission for Scheduled Castes and Scheduled Tribes has sought a detailed report on the incident from the university. Meanwhile, student groups have called for a bund against Jain University. That's the piece of break news that's coming in. I'm joined by my colleague Harish, who's getting us this piece of break news. So Harish, give us the details. What are the charges against these nine suspects, including the festival organizer as well as the principal? Well, uh, nine people, as you rightly mentioned, have been arrested. Uh, this includes uh, seven students. And uh, one other person who's been arrested uh, is uh, the principal of the university and also the organizer. Remember, uh, there were several charges uh, that were uh, slapped against the organizers, the college, and the students who had performed this particular play uh, uh, under the Siddhapura police station limit. And uh, many of them had raised previous objection to it saying that it was hurting someone's sentiment and also they should be moved under the SASC Atrocities Act. And after widespread criticism, Siddhapura police who, have, uh, who had booked the FIR have now decided to arrest uh, all these people. Uh, there are certain question marks on whether IDD uh, students should have been arrested. Is it an extreme step? But the police, they're not wanting to take chances, have uh, just uh, followed the law and arrested all the accused. Right. Thank you, Harish, for getting us that piece of breaking news. Now, the theme of this year's Aero India is the runway to a billion opportunities. Over the next four days, Asia's biggest air show will showcase India's growth in aerospace and the defence sector. The focus of the event is to showcase indigenous equipment and technology, as well as forging partnerships with foreign companies. This is in line with the Make in India, Make for the World vision of the Modi government. <laughs> बेंगलुरु का आसमान आज इस बात की गवाही दे रहा है कि नई ऊंचाई नए भारत की सच्चाई है आज देश नई ऊंचाइयों को छू भी रहा है और उन्हें 
पार भी कर रहा है The Indian Navy is looking at buying fighter jets, especially for its INS Vikrant jets that can operate from the deck of INS Vikrant. There are two contenders for it. One is the Rafael M, the other is the F-18 Super Hornet. If you compare how both of them operate, well, Super Hornet scores over Rafael in certain aspects and Rafael does same in few other aspects. Within visual range combat, the Rafael M actually would be in a very dominant position against this Super Hornet. In almost all circumstances, is what experts believe. Well, the other aspect is uh, Super Hornet is the winner of when it comes to weapon options. Although Rafael can carry a greater payload, is what experts say. Well, if you look at Rafael, where it scores, Rafael is also capable of uh, super cruise, and also it is very comfortable when it goes even at a altitude of around 30,000 feet, and. When it comes to range, not much differentiating between Rafael M and the Super Hornet. Both of them, in fact, uh, are capable of mid-air refueling and have similar, similar endurance and uh, capabilities. Jet suit can make you fly. Recently, Indian Army issued one RFP regarding procurement of 48 jet suits in Indian Army. And soon after that, People were curious as to how these jet suits will be used in Indian Army. And today, here in Aero India, we have got one display where you can see this jet suit by Absolute Composites Private Limited. What is the technology behind and while it is about functions, so what are the functions? I am joined by Mr. Raghav. Mr. Raghav, you tell me, first of all, the functionality. How we can use these jet suits? Because we got to know that this particular suit can make you fly. Yes, it can make you fly. You asked me two questions. One is the functionalities and the usability of it. So functionalities, I, uh, you know, this is powered by turbojet engines, which are fueled by diesel fuel. And uh, you have two engines on the right-hand gauntlet attached, and you have two on the left-hand side, and three engines on the rear. You know, we have a fire retardant uh, overall, and uh, heat insulated and also fire retardant uh, boots uh, along with the safety helmet and uh, it would also have a, a noise cancellation uh, headphones and also a mic. A uh, person would carry somewhere in between 40 to 50 kgs based on how long he want to fly. The Indian Army is looking for such suits, 48 such suits. So what about uh, you know your part and uh, your proposal on it? See it came as a pleasant surprise to us. We realized that you know we have to respond to it because you know we have the equipment ready with us, and we were just training the pilots because pilot training we don't get uh, trained pilots on this because this is a new equipment, and uh, we are formulating the course for training the pilots. This equipment is already 70% indigenous. It will be 80% indigenous when we supply. If at all we get an opportunity to supply. Shifting focus, the death toll from the earthquake that struck Turkey and Syria has crossed 36,000, but there is still hope amid despair. Rescuers pulled a 13-year-old from the rubble of a collapsed building in Turkey's southern Hatay province more than a week after the devastating quake. According to the United Nations, the phase of rescue is coming to a close, with urgency now switching to shelter, food and medical care. The spotlight is also on accountability, ladies and gentlemen. 113 arrest warrants have been issued in connection with the construction of buildings and col that collapsed and at least 12 people have been arrested, including contractors. Now, CNN News 18, Siddhant Mishra has been travelling the length and breadth of Turkey to bring us the ground reality. You can see uh, the setup has been made where food is being distributed. In fact, there are a lot of people, those who have, those who have become homeless, they are also sleeping on the roads and in fact they are also roaming around here. This entire stretch is completely, completely devastated. It is going to take many years for this city to be rebuilt and in fact it is going to be a very challenging job for the government here to rebuild this city of Maris, this old town of Maris. The humanitarian aid, the supplies are also being provided here, but 
the challenge is before the agency is to clear this site. You can see this another debris hill, which is of 25 to 30 feet. So this is a situation of Maris where we are reporting from and we are reporting from the heart of the city. What people are looking for is a hope and with each passing day, the hope for life is fading out. Antakya in Turkey is heavily devastated. We are reporting from the interiors of Antakya, building after building, complete destruction enormous destruction that has taken place and in fact these areas these neighborhoods have completely been evacuated by authorities nobody is living in these buildings and in fact there are some some commandos from the authorities those who have been given task here to uh, keep law and order intact otherwise look at the destruction now this is the level of destruction and one can imagine the intensity with which the quake stuck the city of Antakya. Now you can see the, uh, the debris on the cars parked here. This is a residential locality where we are reporting from. The entire multi-story building has come down, has collapsed. The rescue operation has got over there. Then there you see two vehicles, two SUVs have come under the debris. It is going to take more than, more than one year to clear all the debris in Antakya uh, because the level of destruction is massive and more than any other uh, city in, uh, in Turkey. And in fact, we have also been advised not to roam on the streets because these buildings are so weak. You can see the entire building is vacant. Uh, the authorities have evacuated it. This is a level of destruction and it is going to be a task for the government. Death follows Syrians everywhere. Those are the chilling words of a quake survivor in northwestern Syria where finding aid is still a big issue as the country was hit in the middle of a raging civil war which started 11 years ago. CNN's Jomana Karache gets us this report. Baby Mohammed takes every little labored breath on his own. No mom, no dad to hold his tiny hand. His parents didn't survive the earthquake. The three-month-old was rescued by neighbors who brought him to this ICU. In the room next door, we find Ghalia. The 26-year-old will never walk again. The earthquake brought down her family's home and crushed her back. Her stepmom tells us Ghalia and her three children were under the rubble for 18 hours. The children survived, but they don't know where they are. In every room of the Syrian hospital, a bittersweet tale of survival. Many more should have been alive today to tell their stories. Doctors say they tried to save them, but didn't have enough supplies to save everyone. The few medical facilities in rebel-held Syria are barely still standing after years of Russian and Syrian regime bombardment that left them ill-equipped to deal with a disaster of this magnitude. We lost a lot of patients because of shortages in medical supplies. If we had them, we could have saved many more lives. This was the scene here last Monday and in other facilities run by the Syrian American Medical Society. This is the biggest disaster we ever had. We dealt with war injuries, but never had to deal with this many casualties at once. The people of this devastated land cried for help, but no help came. Aid to rebel-held northwest Syria is tied in politics and at the mercy of a regime so cruel, even at a time like this. They dig and dig with their bare hands and whatever they can find, desperately trying to reach their loved ones. It's too late for rescues now. They just want to bury their dead. Mohammed is searching for relatives. Expressionless and numb, he tells us 21 of them, including children. Life here feels like one endless cycle of loss and grief. Most have been displaced time and time again by more than a decade of war. They're now homeless once again. We were sleeping under the trees, but it was so cold we came here, Om Sultan tells us. She begs the international community to send them shelters. We just want a tent, she says. I wish we had died with everyone else so we don't go through this, she tells us. We survived only to live this misery and agony. They have nowhere left to run. Millions are trapped in Idlib. It's the last rebel-held territory in Syria.
But Mohammed says that she and her family fled Aleppo province and came here. She says they escaped the uh, fighter jets and the airstrikes. And she says we came here and the earthquake followed us. She says death follows Syrians everywhere. 700 people lived in this now flattened residential complex. Only a handful survived. Young men from nearby villages came running to help get people out, she tells us. But what can they do? They tried digging. We heard people screaming, get us out, get us out. Then they went quiet. They all died. Two days later, they pulled a little boy and girl. Their dead bodies were still warm. Others made it. After hours of this painstaking rescue, little Ahmed was pulled out alive. The White Helmets, heroes of Syria's war, did all they can to save as many as they can. They urgently appealed for international support. They didn't send anything. They didn't respond. They let the people here down, and now the people here in Syria I really know that now they are forgotten. <laughs> Half of the city crashed down in just 60 seconds. Reporting from the center of the city. Behind me, you can see this publicity board which is not operational. It's written there, Kehraman Maras Cosmopolitan. So Kehraman Maras is one cosmopolitan city of Turkey. Completely destructed. Devastated. This is Azir was a dissenting voice, like when the Supreme Court brought down the curtains on the thousand year old practice of triple talaq amongst Muslims. Along with the then CGI Justice Keher, Justice Nazir had noted that talaqe bidat is a matter of personal law of Sunni Muslims, and that being a component of personal law, it has protection under Article 25 of the Constitution. He also noted that triple talaq among Muslims was an integral part of their religion and faith, and it cannot be dismissed as unconstitutional. At the most, he said in his judgment, that it can be called gender discriminatory practice that can be done away by way of legislation. Before he agreed with the unanimous verdict of the Ayodhya bench, he had earlier dissented against the majority view that refused to refer the issue to a larger bench. In September of 2018, a three-judge Supreme Court bench, in a majority opinion 2-1, declined to refer the question if a mosque as a place of prayer is an essential part of Islam. Justice Nazir observed that the question of what is essential or not essential in a religion cannot be decided hastily. He held that the question raised on the essentiality of offering